<laughs> yo, welcome to my brain, yo. So look back here. <laughs> back here we got the insecure part that questions like, should I be doing this? And then this part is the roughly huh? Hi, I'm Casa. This is Mikey. Everybody else. Gio, Haley, Ted, Ian behind the camera, David on the boards. We just improvised for like 12 minutes. I played drums. Mikey played guitar with hella effects and stuff. And for some reason, we used the I Got Five on an instrumental as the backing track. <laughs> So we recorded over I Got Five on it. And and then we just improvised. The track ended and we just kept improvising for like another five minutes. And now what I'm doing is I'm trying to find a I'm trying to organize what we did in some type of thing to use as a basis to build a song, to find some new chords, find some melodies, find some lyrics, just like get a vibe. And this is just kinda to uh show one of the processes of how I sometimes find stuff. So like, it starts out being like I got five on it and then like, you start chopping stuff up and you start finding things that are totally unrelated and then the chords, you start arranging the chords in different ways and and then you have this whole other thing. But part of the reason I like doing it like this is that you still get that uh, improvis improvisational energy behind it. You know what I mean? It, I just I didn't even listen to the whole ten minute thing, but I found like eight measures that felt cool, and then I started chopping up the eight measures, and then like I'm gonna add some drums, some like produced drums. I'm gonna add some of my weird vocal isms, and then. I'm going to show you like how I did that in the past with other songs. Cause okay, okay. All right, so here we go. It's pretty basic you know it's like a guitar riff and it's some some drum improvisations but with the rhythms from the drums and and these melodies that are coming out of the chop guitar there's a bunch of stuff there like there's already little like lyrical like the the drumming I'm hearing like lyrics <laughs> to see a Mikey Hart though that line though that pretty little
that way. <laughs> Always a winner. Yeah. <laughs> maybe like maybe the per drum set is like not cutting it or. <laughs> Maybe it's like I'll take two measures of that whole thing and loop that and start a whole new thing with those two measures. You know, it's a constant process of framing and. <laughs> Some drums that aggressively rigid. I could take some other drums from that same recording. I just wanted to, to show like a basic like how we would normally get in the door with one of the ways to get in the door and um, the second thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show how that happened in the past successfully because <laughs> I can't say that that was necessarily successful or not you know what I mean it's like I don't know yet you know so what I wanted to pull up was Aaron Parks at the, the time capsule. I'm gonna show you how that became like a finished song that ended up on my album. So, you know how I play. Whatever, you know, and then Rashawn Carter on bass.
so I spent like many weeks working on this like by myself with like just that piano part and like production writing lyrics vocals adding other drums and stuff within the sound of silence What have we here? What have we here? What have we here? the secret within the sound of silence i ended up like finishing that tune getting it mixed and everything and then we performed that tune live in the finale and then we went into the studio a week later and performed that this tune with uh julius rodriguez paul wilson and morgan garen and myself in the studio and we ch we we put this on pads. We had people playing samples of this on pads. I was playing drum set and I did the poem and we did it like this live performance. So boom, this final version has, it has Aaron as the composer and original sample. It has Stefan Crump playing acoustic bass on the first half of it. Um, Morgan playing like floor time in the studio me playing drum set vocals paul wilson playing the original samples which are aaron parks in the studio julius playing piano on top of that piano then morgan garen later playing on the outro playing electric bass and an iwi solo and then i had jay horde sing the vocal part that i originally did at the end you dig so it's like it's four versions of one song and I mean technically you don't have to do that like I don't know why I do that all the time but I think what the thing I like about it is one is like I come from sample culture so it's like I'm trying to reuse this tool which is sample process and two is the final thing even if it's a very simple musical thought it's so layered it sounds like there's just so many layers of just sonic texture that kind of is like why does that sound like that? So I'm going to play that. Find me. Can you see me? Can you see me? Are you sleeping? Are you sleeping? In the sound of silence.
learns the lessons you teach yourself. The bowing butler hears the secret within the sound of silence. 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 Oh my god. track if you don't know you don't know but you see you get the idea and it's like uh the interesting thing about it is like we have parts that were composed or whatever finished but we were still improvising in our presentation of those ideas and then there are like ideas that were improvised that became like finite made static made solid and it's just this process of constantly weaving between the two and just trying to like scatter the whole differentiation between the two. It's like, it's never really finished, you know? It's never done. I could take that now and start over and go and do another, you know? So that's just what floats my boat, you know? I don't know if, I don't know if it's, if it's, if it's the way anybody else does it or whatever, but that's kind of the, the vibes with that. Um, so, one other thing I've been getting into lately is, you know, I still love sampling songs that are already other people's songs. Like, I miss, now that I'm, like, trying to make all original sonic material or, like, sample my own recordings, it's like I miss chopping up other people's stuff and everything. So um, this, this Shades of Flu series I've been working on... Um, it's just been kind of my way of interacting with other people's music and finding ways to like reframe other songs. So I guess the, the approach I take to that is like, if I hear something that I like or like something that like might be slept on and I imagine like, how would I would like to hear that? Or how could it, how could I reframe that to give it a whole nother identity, you know? And um, so, the thing I wanted to play today was a Chris Davis tune. Uh, you heard Die Tom Rippins, right? The album? Yeah, so I took, I'm not even sure which tune it was, the name of it, but I took one of those tunes. Oh, that's not it. That's not the original. Where's the original? Let me pull it up here. There we go. So I took one of the, the Chris Davis joints. And this ain't out yet. Or whatever. <laughs> this is still like an idea and process. Uh, but I took one of her joints. Since I was always rather a rebellious student, I decided that instead of playing all those scales, I would make my own scales. And I would make my own conception of, of the vertical, which is the harmonic, the horizontal, which is the linear. And, and in doing that, began the pleasure principle. Because if you, if you make your scale based on that which pleases your senses, so that it is not a question. So the thing with this one, this was the first, this was the first, one of the first joints that I made where I didn't actually know what time it was in. 
before I started cutting into it. You know what I mean? Like I just I just was like dealing with the pulse. And I was feeling like a three, but it might have been five or whatever, you know. But but what was weird was I was able to not have to activate that part of my brain that's like uh, the mathematical odd time drummer calculator. And I, I was able to like stretch it and chop it up without ever thinking about a time signature. And, and so then I ended up producing like a 4-4 four, four kind of boom bap thing on top of it and it goes against of it kind of like some multimeter kind of thing yeah. so I'll just play you a couple measures of that to kind of show the first thing about it was I did this like A A A it's like a, a, one of my uh, tropes yeah. right like but a yeah it's my little A on the upbeat but instead the A's are a polyrhythm of the original. So right off the top you hear it's like what's going on? Chris. Terry. Val. Save my life. JD. Right, so that I did that somehow. I did that without actually calculating it. I just like if you mute, uh, if you mute Chris. Put them together and they got a Chris. Terry. The thing about the I the, the Chris is actually not really chopped. It's like that's that's her pattern. I put drops in it. Saved my life. Yeah. I, boot, I beef, boot, beefed it up, you know. But yeah, so boom. So you go down later, and I just kind of went further with the same concept. Thank you. 
last little piece of this one that's interesting is uh, I think that's Tony Malaby that comes in. Mm -hmm. Here, so I put this one in six, and then like halfway through it, I just switch it into four somehow. Yeah, it's just putting is nine over four, basically, you know. But like, a, I guess the weird thing is that like, I was able to do that without actually calculating it. It was all kind of like, almost musical, kind of melodic. Like, well, this as long as it hits together when it's time to, you know. The other thing is you don't have to be in a big studio. A lot of this is like it's just the you can do this with like anything. You know, I sampled last night. I'm staying with Ted right now. Last night, I sampled these keys that he let me hold. And it was like, I put it really close up on the mic. And it ended up being like the thing that saved this, this other song. Matter of fact, let me play you 10 seconds of that and then we out of here. Uh, this is actually an Artemis remix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, like, no, who's remixing Artemis right now, man? You know, like, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, yeah, I'll just start from the top. I'm gonna play a minute and 40 seconds of this remix because I was working on it last night. Uh, interesting thing is this listen for this. <laughs> Because without it, it sounded too mechanical and too much like a beat. And I was like, I need something organic. So like without it, this, which is cool, but it needed a
go whenever you guys are. I realize that's how you get away from looking at your phone too much. The first step is you got to have a watch. Yeah, an Apple Watch. <laughs> an Apple Watch, exactly. <laughs> all right, so, you know, um, thank you all for sticking with us. If you saw the last portion, if you didn't, welcome to the show. It's your boy, Casa Overall. I'm sitting here with the homie, Gio Rusinello. We're going to talk about musical process and whatever else might come up um we might talk about how to get away from your phone make sure you get a watch if you want to stop looking at your phone too much get a watch major key uh geo what's up man man. thank you for having me thank you for showing up bro um well so we're in brooklyn you're back from Seattle. seattle where you've been for most of quarantine right yes i have um what have you been doing? I mean, let's just start broadly and then we'll sort of zero in because I really enjoyed watching you work um, and it filled in the missing pieces a lot of what I'm listening to. Um, I love to listen and try to let it become visual in a natural way. And what, what I amba- envisioned and imagined is not entirely what I saw, which was cool. Yeah. But in terms of the last year, I mean, we've been locked down for 11 months now. Right. So like what has been keeping you moving forward and how has your process that you already had developed um, kind of equipped you to move through this solitary time? Yeah. You know? It's interesting, man, because before uh, the lockdown started, you know, I went to Seattle on March 11th, and that was basically right when everything kind of stopped. But uh, before that happened, I had been doing a lot of the things that everybody's starting to learn how to do, whether that's, like, record at the crib, uh, record remotely, sending tracks back and forth, and all of that, and I, it was almost like, it's just something I liked. I liked that process, you yeah. know. I liked the mobile studio idea. Um, the only thing that was a real drawback for me was that I loved going to people's houses and setting up my little rig, and you know, still being in the room because that, the idea of like sharing atoms and being in the same space and building energetically was still like a big part of i think the texture i like you Mm -hmm. know but just the idea of being self-sufficient being able to like be in a room by yourself and create a whole universe inside a box and keep expanding on that that's kind of something i've been building on for my whole career as a musician you know and that part of that came from touring Part of that came from just more comfortable sometimes with nobody around, you know. You talk about, like, all the people that are ingo- involved in making that work, right? And the fact that you want to kind of be in uh, in a uh, nucleus with a lot of particles in it, right? Yeah. Or, like, a, an atom with a lot of swirling kind of elements. Yeah. And one thing that really strikes me and that I was noticing even more deeply as I watched you and listened to you talk about your process is that the identities of the different makers become really, um, I don't want to say flattened out, like rolled out, but in fact they become, they kind of float into and out of each other. They kind of disappear and reappear. Yeah. And who played what is both like essential and also totally ambiguous. Yeah. And I wonder if, like this is maybe like a few steps down the line if we want to like really talk through the process, but I'm really, I mean, obviously this music that, this tradition that's rapidly developing, right, um, is one that is centered in people getting together and listening to each other really hard and responding (laughs) and sharing. But you're also kind of making people disappear in your music while also letting them come alive together. Yep. It's this weird ephemera of, like, identities becoming a thing you know that's more unified than it is separated out Mm -hmm. so i wonder how do you keep track of or do you keep track of who made what which piece belongs to whom yeah how much of it is well you know i'm grateful for that experience we had together in that room and now we're all just sort of at the mercy of the sound (laughs) yeah i mean i definitely i definitely keep track of everything because it's so experiential you know what i mean a lot of times like it's like it's almost like keeping track of like this conversation like 
you speaking it's your voice it's you you know what i mean you feel that so it's like aaron parks is thumbprint on that song is just there you know what i mean and then the other thing is i feel like there's a bunch of different things i would speak on to what you said but a few of the things like one of the things is sometimes you separate like you're talking about everything being together right but sometimes what i do is i separate the people from the whole at times like because I might want a player to play something, but not in relation to like the whole program bass drum. I want them to play more like they're playing to a ballad. So they might just play to the drum part with the piano and I get that kind of more ballad type of bass playing, you know? And if I was to play the whole track, they would react to it in a whole different way. So sometimes it's a game of like, what you reveal, what you don't reveal. Sometimes you, like, a lot of times, uh, Stefan Crump, the bassist, he's like the glue at the end on a lot of songs. Like, some songs have so much stuff that his, like, really perfect sound, perfect time, just every, he's just one of my favorite bassists, right? Yeah, he's got so much. He's got it all, right? Too, yeah. And he has the great home recording setup. Oh, word. Right? So what I would do is I'd often come to him last, and he would put those notes on the final thing, and it would glue the whole thing together. But what's interesting is you're talking about also doing the opposite, where you give informa- give less information to each individual Yeah, artist. sometimes it's less. Sometimes it just kind of depends and. I guess I'm just fo- at a certain point I'm just following the 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 song. Like I'm trying to find out where the song wants to go or like in a more like less abstract way like what does the song still need? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But um I was talking to uh uh Francis Francis in the Lights. He's a fr- a friend of mine and we were talking about a song and he said you know at a certain point once you get the song to a certain point it's not in your hands anymore mm-hmm. and it just kind of it goes where it needs to go mm-hmm. and you have to be willing to let go mm-hmm. <clears throat> excuse me so i think a lot of it is that just trying to find it you know what i mean what do you like about having different parts different components performed by different people in different contexts Okay. What you're describing is is allowing multiple contexts, in fact, to live together. Exactly. Right. And what that, yeah, that's why I like that. I can't say exactly, uh-huh. but I know I like that. What do you like about it? What I, does it allow you? I like that. It's just kind of the way I grew up making music was to sample something that was already made. It was made in a different context, and you take it and recontextualize it. Right. So therefore. If I want to do that process in the present moment, it's to get somebody to make something in a different headspace. So it's like, to be honest, the sound of a bass player locking right up with my bass drum, you know, like, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, a lot of people like that, but Mm -hmm. I like it. I like the kind of multiple beat wish wash you know what i mean even like if you listen to um john coltrane's classic quartet Mm. the way they played the time it was this undulating circle Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they were all hitting different pieces of the the cycle and that's what made it like like this you know and so i'm trying to i'm trying to find that even if i'm working with like a click track if i'm quantizing drums yeah. which means you know if i'm time correcting stuff right there's so there's so much ability to access the ideal of perfect mm. that i'm actually seeking imperfect mm-hmm. you know i'm trying to find ways to like make it a little what do they call it wabi sabi or whatever yes exactly yeah exactly yeah. um but it's definitely not so elegant and simple in our lives these days as a wabi-sabi existence we're we're overstimulated we're hyper-fed uh-huh. we're dealing with trying to escape from the stuff that's like just 
crowding its way into our brains. Too right? much information. And information that's also aesthetic information. Visuals slapping us. Super <laughs> highly elevated, like in the mix audio. You know, yeah. if you look at the, the trajectory of pop music over yeah. the past 50 years, like yeah. it's gotten louder and louder in the mix, right? Yep. Um, do you listen to like, did you listen to Sophie or like uh, any like hyper pop, like uh, 100 Gex, like any of that, like really over the top, like sick, throwing a hundred different samples into one pop song or one like techno song, right? It's no, a, but I know what you're talking about. You know about. what I'm talking about. Yeah. It feels like a feels like a siren uh on top of a pop song on top of like uh you know a mishmash right yeah so it's interesting i I just like i feel like it's very of the moment but there's also something um that you want to like pare down at this not necessarily pare down but in fact go into something get deeper into into a place musically Mm -hmm. um so okay like let me try and back this up i think what really struck me was the amount that the human voice and through that like the kind of the chamber of the body is like heard in your music yeah like that's really where so much centers itself right yeah why that's the that's the narrator Uh it's almost like um there's two things that i think like connect the listener like i like i like to make music that anybody could listen to right and if it's if you want to let's say you listen to a lot of uh, complex music, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. you can listen to it in that way. But if you don't know anything about that at all, and your your ear hasn't developed yet to hear some of the more complicated things, there's an access point for the most simple, you know, for a toddler or for whoever, you know, to that can get into it and and like get it somehow, yes. you know, yeah. just like if you're a master of something, you should be able to explain it to a, a little kid, right? Exactly. So with the music i have the narrator which is like the person out front that's like he can hear all of the com- complexity but actually like doesn't can't perform that complexity you mm-hmm. know like in the sense that i can't really like sing on a tune like i can't really you know one day maybe you know what i mean but like my 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 vocal comes from a like I try to keep it simple, or I I just hear it like that, right? And then the other aspect is the bass drum, Mm -hmm. or the the bass, either the bass frequency or the bass drum. Mm -hmm. That's another anchor point. So Mm -hmm. if you have that pulse and you have the story, anybody can connect with that. Mm -hmm. And then it slowly becomes more layers of complexity Mm -hmm. on top of that, you Mm -hmm. know? And that's just, that's just me trying to analyze it. That's not like, that's not like, I sat down and was like, that's what I'm going to do. But at a certain point, you start to realize, like, oh, this works in that way. You know what I mean? And listening to your use of the voice, your reliance on your body to create vocal sounds in a music that's also, like, very produced, right? Um, I was just thinking of Milford Graves, who had, who's just passed away. Yeah. I was thinking of Robert Ashley and Joan LaBarbera. And, like, some of these more experimental, like, composers who use voice and layers of voice, right? And, like, kind of turn that into its own instrument. Um, I was thinking of people outside of Western music who have used the voice in ways that maybe have deep history but are unfamiliar to us, like Mach Latini or uh, or Miriam Makeba in Uh, South Africa. uh There's just so many ways that the voice can, like, transmutate, right? And, like, just, like become super malleable yeah i wonder who are your who are the people that you've heard do that and you've said wow like absolutely uh that's funny man i mean i know what you're saying it's like the voice becomes like the idea of like these notes and rhythms is almost secondary and there's this other information which is like vibrational textural and and that kind of thing exactly but um a lot of people, most, almost everybody in a sense, you know, like, mm. what's, his, uh, t- you know, Radiohead, like Tom York from Radiohead yes. was like one yes. of the first people that I heard that was like, it was like, is that a note? Like, yeah. I don't know if that's a note or is that a sound effect, you know, coming out of his mouth. But then at the same time, like, even as one of the first singers that I got into was Bob Marley when I was a 
toddler, you know. Yeah. But half of the things that I liked about his voice was the, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. the, the, like, emotion. It was like, I don't really know exactly everything he's talking about, but I understand how he's feeling. You know what I mean? Right. And um, yeah. I think that quality, that comes through in, in a lot of people that it might not be so much obvious, like, purposeful you know mm -hmm. but i think i've always been listening to people's voice for like the other story that's coming through that like emotive mm -hmm. quality you know mm -hmm. um so yeah, i don't think that's a great answer but that like a great answer no that totally that's how makes it feels. Sense. bob dylan too you know Jimi yeah. hendrix they're uh -huh. all kind of like old dirty bastard uh-huh yes they're, it's yes. like a lineage of like singers that it's not exactly singing but there's like this other thing yes beyond the notes on the paper thing you exactly. know what i mean exactly um listening to your use of uh chris davis's record and like you're dissecting and layering on top and like deciding i'm not gonna dissect but instead i'm just gonna like let it run through me and see what happens you know i was thinking about the big problem so to speak, in, like, jazz music of the past few decades, which is, like, repertory. And, like, how do we treat the standards, and then how do we also make our own new standards? And it's been this pesky problem, right? And it's like, man, cats don't write ballads anymore. Like, man, cats don't play each other's tunes anymore. Man, the younger cats don't play the Gen X cats' tunes, right? There's not a carriage forward. Uh -huh. And it, you run into these problems over and over and then you start to think, well, maybe they're not quite solvable. And then yeah. I heard you do that. Uh -huh. And I was like, <clears throat> well, Casa is treating this as repertory in a way, but he's doing it differently. And it made me think about the fact that the, the, the very use of the jazz standard, the very notion of having a jazz standard that musicians play over and over is probably simply an African american musical kind of act with western modernist compositions okay right so you've got these compositions and then you're gonna and they're kind of like 32 bar pieces and then you're gonna do a thing that's basically like kind of iterating on top of them doing my version of like my it's a remix you know, it's a remix and yeah. so that made me think well hip-hop is no different right because it's taking a james brown beat and it's turning it into a hip-hop song which is Simply, the materials are different on either end, both the source material and the refashioning material, right? The, it's a funk song instead of a Broadway tune, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's a microphone and a turntable instead of a saxophone and a drum kit, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Now you're doing something else, right? Maybe what you're doing is like another step in this American music tradition of repurposing old stuff. And maybe, and I'm sure you're not going to be like, yes, my intention is to, <laughs> is to forge ahead and make everybody follow me and do this way. But uh, it is interesting to think about, maybe we don't need to start, we need to stop freaking out about like jazz repertory as, as this thing that people don't do anymore because we're kind of attached to the idea that there will be a new standards, right? Mm. Maybe it's just a different way of sharing inspiration, taking inspiration and building on other people's work. Mm -hmm. You know, so like... Does that resonate? Do you feel as though it, you're in a tradition, even though you're doing something really different? When you yeah, do stuff yeah, like that? it does. It half of that totally re like yep. ultimately okay. it does resonate. But the first part, which is like the idea of like this is a problem we've had, right? And I think that the the reason that I I, I have to put a question mark on that, which is basically when we talk about the new standard and we're talking about jazz and we're talking about comparing jazz to hip hop and all this it uh it assumes that that's okay in itself right it's like if we assume it's like assuming the big bang or assuming it's like it's like okay well we have to assume that jazz is this thing and hip hop is that mm -hmm. thing and you know what i mean and only after we assume all that can we start to make these correlations and things mm -hmm. but at the same time I think that the problem is assuming the distinctions, you know what I mean? Assuming that you had this 
this uh, static thing called jazz and this static idea that we look at as hip hop and and then you look back to the you know people today say like oh I don't like the word jazz and this is that and this is that and that's the whole thing in itself but you can watch an interview of Charles Mingus saying that yeah. and you can talk, you can watch an interview of Max Roach saying he didn't like that and right. Miles Davis didn't like that right. and so even Bird I think said might have said I might have just read something that Bird said you know what I mean so mm-hmm. if the legends and the heroes and the founders of this whole thing that we call jazz said don't call it jazz then like we have some serious like uh organizational like we have some Mm -hmm. some basic architectural questions to ask right you know what i mean and um and then the second thing is if they didn't like calling it that why why did like why Mm -hmm. why didn't they want to call it that and so that leads me to think that maybe they're they are saying like maybe that idea is like limiting maybe that term is limiting our potential you know Mm -hmm. it might be cutting us off from the past or the future you know what i mean and so i think that even though i do use the term jazz to describe something at the same time it's like the goal isn't so much to mix jazz and hip-hop anymore right because i've had that conversation a lot Right. with myself with the music and with others but now i'm starting to go like well maybe i don't want to be having that conversation because that conversation assumes some things that i'm not necessarily trying to assume mm-hmm. you see what mm-hmm. i mean mm-hmm. now with all that being put to the side mm-hmm. the idea of what i'm doing being connected with the the hip-hop version of the remix and the jazz version of the remix 100 percent agree Mm -hmm. and um the other part of it is when i'm doing these remixes and stuff it's also what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to take everything i learned from traditional jazz study right Mm -hmm. i'm trying to take all the things i learned from just trying to learn how to play the drums just trying to learn how to learn what elvin did and learn what max did I'm trying to take all that and apply it to 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 new things. Mm-hmm. But it's the same thing. It's mm-hmm. the same like it's the same like nine over four. Mm-hmm. You know, it's right. the same. It's all these things that were like idea. They were ideals. They were like philosophical thoughts that could be applied to a drum set. That could be applied to um, I got rhythm. Mm-hmm. Sure, but playing i got rhythm isn't the the philosophical thought that's just an application of it precisely yeah how do you define that that philosophical orientation that you bring into this work you know like what is it i think a lot of it does have to do with getting together with people as you said at the very beginning of this conversation and like allowing them to respond you know uh to each other and also to your own context making but but beyond that, you know, like what what's the philosophical thing that's being carried forward here? Perfect. Okay. So uh this was the I had a thought. Wait. My oh yeah. My question was what's the philosophical uh orientation you're bringing forward yeah. here? Yeah. So this is the thing, man. I think it really comes down to trying to activate the intuitive brain. Trying to activate the mm. the mystery brain the 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 you know what i mean the thing that like you can't just like calculate and you know exactly. apply it to something you know exactly. it's like the thing that you can't just buy you yeah. know what i yeah. mean yeah. the 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 mystery thing and it's like i think that comes that that taps into a lot of like that's been connected to every type of of African culture stuff I've been diving into. Yeah. You know what I mean? Whether that's like from the djembe to the NPC. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It's always been like it was always been like you mess with it until it has this thing to it, mm. and it's like I can't explain why it feels good like that. Right. Right. <laughs> and, right. And I'll tell you if it don't. 
I'll right. tell you if it does. I'll tell you if it don't. And it's hard. You can't really put your finger on exactly what that is. And so, like, hmm. for me, it's like I'm trying to find that even in the most electronic, most calculated way, I'm still trying to find that thing, it's the like, intuitive brain. I love that. Like, the idea of deep, right, and depth and of seeking down and of going toward the earth like the further down you go the darker it gets mm -hmm. and the harder it is to see yep but the closer you are to something yeah you know yeah you're you're closer to something that is not already you're closer you're into the unknown you know you're tapping into something that still needs to be brought brought into right yeah so I think about Milford Graves so much when we have conversations like this. Um, and he was somebody that you and I were speaking on the phone about last night. Uh -huh. And um, he's somebody who had his compass set to an ideology as well. His was similar to something that you're talking about, I think. He was really, he believed in the idea of cosmic energy. Uh -huh. Kind of an ashe like notion. Yeah, yeah. But also all these different very innovative ways of accessing it and yeah. processing it and of going further than others might have ever done yeah and he really we were talking about this on the phone he really went his own way like in order to do that he just said like i got it you know like if you want to give me some resources maybe okay but like let, let's see where i get on my own first you know what i mean yeah and these last 11 months of quarantine, um, we've all been sort of left to our own devices to a certain degree. <laughs> yeah. And you talked a lot about, uh, when we were speaking yesterday, you talked about um, being able to dial in and, like, deal with so many fewer distractions, right? Yeah. What has this time done for you in terms of accessing that philosophical point, accessing your own modus operandi, like, and, like, kind of, like, reaffirming what matters at the core of your practice you know? yeah you know that's funny though it's funny because this this past year i wouldn't say you would think it's like well i didn't have anything i had nowhere to go and i could just like lock in and get all you know what i mean zend out sure but nah yeah. you know it's weird it was like it was like there's been a lot of times during this lockdown where i was thinking to to the past of times when I would, I had my routine all together and I was totally tuned in. Mm -hmm. And then I've had some times that were super tuned in during this lockdown, but it's, it's definitely been hard. And there's even been times where I was like, how am I so busy? Like mm -hmm. how, <laughs> I don't Same. have nowhere to go. Yep. How am I, you know, it's I'm not supposed to have actually. days like this, you yeah. know, but, um, but, but on the other side of that, uh, I've been I've been close to family, and I've been back. I've been in the house I grew up in. I mean, I was born in. Wow. I've wow. been like, I've been back in my hometown, and I've been like, just connecting back to some of the basics. Yeah. And I'm realizing there's a whole nother there's a chi there too. You know, there's like the, there's that like, just the mold that you grew from you know what i mean Absolutely. your fungus you know what i mean mm. and so it's like uh that has been super real and i think that i actually hope to even expand that more i was just thinking about people that i grew up with that i haven't hit up recently or that you know somebody might have reached out to me but it's like you just be in that that sauce of just stuff happening and you kind of I'm thinking like, man, I need to check on so and so or this person. Right. So, a good number of people that you work with are people that you have known for a long time. Yeah. That come from where you come from. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Why has that been something that has showed up in your in your work so much? Um, I think that you know, for me, a lot of time what I'm what I make is just a product of, like where I am and who I'm close to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So some of that is people I've known for a long time some of that is like just people that i'm around in the in the moment of it you mm -hmm. know but i guess that one thing about my music it feels like almost like a it's some kind of strange diary mm. of just like well this is important to me that's important to me you know and like 
even this song, the the Chris Davis with Terry and Val and J D, like all those people connect to Jerry Allen for me. You know, like that like actually there's a thing there that's like connecting back to like how I even got into this, you know, and so I'm trying to like it's like I'm trying to like grab on to all these things that like there's like this this invisible map of like things that matter yes and i'm trying to just make some stuff that just just kind of points at it a little right you know what i mean and and i guess that actually makes the music feel a little richer oh, for yeah. me and i guess if it feels richer for me then the people listening can feel that too right right you mentioned Terry Lynn Carrington, one of the great drummers of today, and and somebody whose music we were hearing through your music, uh -huh. her drumming through your through your work on that track, and yeah. um, you recently joined up with her for her project, yeah. right? Social Science. Yeah. I just wanted to hear because her drumming is so strong, especially on on that record. I mean, it just uh, it really it holds together a thing that is also very diffuse, right? Like yeah. that music. Yeah. Um, and I just was curious as a drummer in another drummer's band and as somebody a generation younger and somebody, uh, you know, to be in the presence of, of a great, you know, elder like that. Um, yeah. Can you talk about Terrilyn Carrington's importance and, and yeah. maybe what you might have learned over the past couple oh, of years working with her? Of course, man. I think that um, one of the things that's interesting about, uh, especially with your same instrument, it kind of takes some time to hear somebody's concept. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I've always thought she was a great drummer. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always known she could play, and I've seen her crush it. And even in high school, I saw her mm -hmm. at, a, uh, at a festival in France with Herbie. You know, like I knew she was official, right? But yeah. we were on tour. Like we did a few gigs. And we were talking a lot about Jack DeJanette, mm -hmm. and you know she She's she was for her, yep. mentored by him. And um, one day I was watching her sound check, and I heard it. <laughs> you know, it was like it was kind of like I was saying about when you're listening and you hear it as a as a kid, and then you can kind of hear the more complexity. Yeah, I was like right up on her, like she was right here, and and she she did like a. And I just realized, like, oh, I didn't hear a whole percentage of that sound. Right. I had never heard before. Right. And from then on, I could actually, like, understand her language more, you know. Yeah. So it's it's been great to to grow closer and to get that inside look because a lot of times, you know, a lot of most of the musicians out here have something great to offer, but it's like it takes some time to like get inside before you can really access the gyms, you know what I mean? So it's just been, it's been an honor. And also she, she was one of the first people in the jazz scene to pull me in for my like electronic and hip hop production capabilities and stuff. And so right. that actually just reaffirmed like, okay, I got something particular. Like I got my own lane. Right. It's not some weird thing that nobody, like, she, like, she made it official, kind of, you know? Yes, so, yes. Yeah. So. And to spend that time, like you said, like, the amount of insight that you're able to glean just from spending time, like, with her work, even, like, with, with her watching her work, I mean, it's just, in this world that we live in, it's very hard to get extended periods of time appreciating anything, let alone exactly. somebody of another generation, in person, you know, traveling together like yeah it's really special and it's important that we find ways to have that yeah and so yeah i will say one thing about shades of flu was like it was cathartic in my head because it was like that was kind of the goal was to like pull it every all these different people and they all actually connect in different ways and it was again it was like um like a diary it was like a yeah time capsule like dropping breadcrumbs or something yes. you know and just to say like this is all one thing for me, you know, and right, and uh, yeah, so that's and and I'm I'm almost done with another one. Exactly, so. part two, right? Part two, Shades Beautiful. of Flu two, the second wave, nice. but W A V, <laughs> <laughs> second wave. It's not Shades of Two. Uh, Too easy. Shades of Two. <laughs> no. 
No, I, like, I, I think like that, yeah, yeah. I think I think we're locked in. We got a cover done too. So once you make the oh, cover, the, the it's visual a... <laughs> art. The visual's done. All right, beautiful. Once the cover's done, it's the album's done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all one wave file. No, I meant like it's the the, cover. the visual. Oh. Wait. oh. All right, we might have to. Yeah, now that. you have to have the, the deluxe edition. <laughs> there are waves. Know. There, the wave, the idea of waves are kind of incorporated, but it's not a wave file, and I think you're right, bro. <laughs> you can mix it in. Yeah, whoops. It could be a very interesting. Yeah, I might need that wave whoops. in there. Ooh, that's crazy. Who does the visuals? Uh, Jesse Brown. Okay. He's he's from Seattle also. Cool. And um, he's done all my album covers. And, Beautiful. And, uh, well, that's good stuff. And, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Right <laughs> you said, oh, thanks. <laughs> all right. Well, I think we got to get out of here, man. We could talk all night, but I, I'm sure that, like, yes. w- this stream, we only get, like, you know, a 60 minute slot or something. Let's, <laughs> let's peace out, man. Man, thank That's you, it. man. It's great yeah, talking man. to you. So nice. Thank to you talk. For, for, you know, just paying attention a little. Like, that's like you said. It's like we get the, a chance to dive into something, and that's when we get to open it up so yeah man thank you yes indeed we love y'all uh grits <laughs>